Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak today. Uh, it's a real honor and a privilege, and uh, I still shake my head almost daily that we're even in this position of being um, one of Canada's um, uh, communities that's uh, able to showcase its work nationally uh, on a pretty pretty public stage with regard to um, you know the Smart Cities Initiative. And uh, just as a, as, a way, as a way of starting, um, I, I especially shake my head at this because um, I, don't even own, I don't even own a cell phone. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I really am, I think I'm a technology skeptic. And um, perhaps, maybe, maybe not in spite of, but perhaps because of a little bit of that, um, we are where we are today. Um, because I think that there are a lot of cautionary tales out there about smart cities and improper use of technology, and I'll draw a little bit on that in my presentation today. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge that I came to last year's Art of City Building, con uh, Art of City Building um, conference, and I was deeply, deeply inspired by the things that I heard at the Smart Cities panel here last year, and we were finalists at the time. And uh, Bianca Wiley, who has spoken so eloquently around the challenges of poorly done smart cities initiatives, were extremely inspirational to my team and I think influenced a lot of our design. So there's a, a little circularity and I'm also deeply honored to be here um, for that reason. Um, so Bridgewater's entire initiative is around um, reducing energy poverty. And that is the deep need that our Smart Cities Initiative is, is trying to address. Um, we were, I think, um, quite marvelously uh, surprised to, to win uh, the Smart Cities Challenge in the Small Communities category. And um, we're, we're going to try to work hard um, to do that justice. Um, the, the background of our work stems from really about a decade of work in creating a framework for energy transition for small and rural communities. That's, that's actually where our work came from. And um, we wrote an energy transition plan in, uh, that was published in 2018, and that really was the basis for our smart cities work. And in a nutshell, it's around shifting the entire community's energy system from what we have today to one that's um, low carbon in the future and uh, over about a 30-year 30 30 period. So this is, this is actually what we were working on. And um, you know, one of the things that popped out at us during that process is the whole economics of energy. And uh, 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 Bridgewater only has 8,500 inhabitants, and yet we spend $88 million a year on energy as a community, which is kind of a mind-blowing number for a small Atlantic Canadian town. And so we started asking ourselves a lot of questions around wh whose pocket is that coming out of? And the reality is it's coming out of the pockets of people who don't have that money to spend. Um, we in Atlantic Canada have uh, you know, some of Canada's oldest housing stock. There are still lots of homes in my community that have zero insulation in the walls. And we have a terrible situation in Atlantic Canada generally with housing. Um, it's in need of significant renewal. And um, you know, our, our plan doesn't only look at, at housing, it also looks at transportation energy. Um, but we're incredibly dependent on fossil fuels as a as, as, uh, you know, small, spread out, rural Atlantic Canadian communities. We're also really dependent on those fossil fuels to bring us uh, the goods and services that we rely on. And when hurricanes come through, uh, we realize just how reliant we are on, on, you know, on those fuels. We're also living in a context of rapidly rising energy costs. There's been a 90% increase in the price of electricity just in the last 15 to 20 years. That, that has really been felt in our communities um, and uh, is part of this whole equation. So here's the number that blew our minds when we dug into the energy plan. The average household, the average family in my community spends six and a half thousand dollars a year on energy for home and transportation. When you consider that the median income in our town for a, for a household unit is $45,000, that's a lot of money. 
And that really was what raised our awareness of the problem of energy poverty, which first started out as kind of an academic exercise, but it very quickly became personal. Um, so while we suspected that energy poverty was something that uh, was a real, real issue and need in our community, becoming a Smart Cities finalist enabled us uh, through a, a finalist grant that all 20 finalist communities uh, received from the federal government to really dig into this topic very deeply. And um, we discovered that two out of five residents experience difficulty on a, on a chronic or a periodic basis uh, affording energy for home and transportation. And that's enormous. But it's not just the statistics, it's the stories we collected that were also incredibly meaningful and moving and frankly heartbreaking. Um, we interviewed dozens of residents and um, people who work with people experiencing poverty and it was a really eye-opening experience for our entire team um, as well as for the many community partners who came together to work on this common, uh, common cause together. And we have um, a whole report full of stories like this. Um, and the thing is that this is a this is a this is a uh, this is not just unique to Bridgewater, by the way. Um, energy poverty rates are around 40 percent across Atlantic Canada. That research has been triangulated from a number of sources. Now we're just one of the communities that has really dug quite deeply into the into the topic. Um, so you know, I, I wanted to give you a little bit of background as to like what is the topic, what is the issue, because I think that's part of my point today, is that the issue really matters for smart cities initiatives. Um, I don't think that smart cities initiatives should be done uh, with technology as the, as, the, you know, as the end. Technology should be the means. The question is, what is the end? Um, and so in the, in the development of our, of our uh, proposal uh, to create an energy poverty reduction program, you know, which has a lot of the classic uh, characteristics of smart cities initiatives, um, you know, I can't, I don't have the time to explain to you the intricacies of that in my short presentation today. You can read on it, you can read it up on our website, it's a completely public plan. Um, but the, the only part of it that I really wanted to show you is this one slide. And, um, you know, the little bits in the middle there are the different components of the program that work together to reduce energy poverty risk in our community. But the part that I really wanted to show is all the bits around the outside, because those are the outcomes that we're looking for from our program. And the main thing in, in thinking about what was the lesson that we learned in moving through our smart cities journey is that it's all about the outcomes. And if you can be really clear about what those outcomes are that you're trying to generate, that will be an important guiding light in making sure that you don't fall into a lot of the common pitfalls, I think, of smart cities initiative. And so, um, those are also the yardsticks by which we are going to know and be held accountable to our residents and our community that's put a lot of faith into this process. And those are the ones also that will impact people's lives. Um, what, I, what I perceive uh, being a relatively new practitioner in this field is that there, we're at the beginning of what I think is a new wave of smart cities initiatives. And I think that the smart cities, um, you know, the federal smart cities program had the foresight uh, to put some really good ideas down as requirements for the Canadian smart cities initiative. And I think that they are helping to breed this new wave of initiatives that, first of all, are truly grounded in community issues. I think that that's going to be a real touchstone that, again, I'm coming back to over and over again, um, have the values around being 100% community-led, designed, and stewarded, which I think is super important. And because those are two of the key touchstones, they open the initiatives up to approaches that work for small and rural communities, which is still the majority of Canadian, you know, local governments, right? Like, we're, we're, we're a country where there's a high concentration of people in the major cities, but we still have many, many municipalities that are in the similar boat as Bridgewater. We're fairly small. Um, and and that, that final touchstone there of technology as a means and not an end. 
So, you know, the process that we went through, we did a little distilling around, you know, what is it really, from a process perspective, that we did um, that is transferable to other communities? And basically, the way I tell it, tell it to myself is it's just, it's just problem solving. <laughs> you know, the, using smart cities approaches is just making better use of data and information and information systems to make better outcomes for your community. That's, that's all it really is. So starting with deep problem definition, really understanding the issue, sinking into it, working with stakeholders and community members that understand the problem through outcome definition, which is so critical and so often missed. Um, you know, through doing gap analysis and so on and partner and asset mapping and only then talking about solutions and looking very carefully at things like data privacy and governance and how does the solution maintain community control over data and not, you know, something that ends up in a black box and sits in some corporations or some, you know, bureaucrats um, locked file somewhere or f used for nefarious purposes. And then the main point I want to make with this slide is that the technology design comes at the end, right? It comes at, it's the last thing that you do after you determine what it is that needs doing. Um, and then, of course, it's an iterative process, and we're now going through a detailed round two of all of this. Um, but that's really um, the main point I wanted to make there. And so, you know, at the end of it, we created something fancy that looks like this that I won't get into and you can't read. Um, but like we're, we're developing an energy management information system for our entire community. That's like, that's cool. Like that's a new idea, right? But look at what we've already seeded the project with. We've seeded it as an energy management information system that will be for the community by the community, right? So that's, that's really different. That's a new kind of thing. And that's, that's why we're in this innovation space. Um, and again, you can read up on that on our website. So just a couple of things that we learned from this process uh, that I wanted to share with you today. And you know, the first is that I think that smart cities approaches are really just modern interpretations of good problem solving. Um, I also think that communities need to stay true to their desired outcomes and to the principle of maximizing the public good. Um, you know, I think that I think that the the, the uh, Ramon's ex uh, you know constant referral to you know how do we make it how do we drive public good good out of these arrangements with you know private sector partners the project as a whole the Smart Cities Initiative needs to keep thinking about that um, and then of course that the private sector can really provide incredible solutions but only after governance and outcomes have been established and that those are really the, the cornerstones of the project, and a community shouldn't, can, can continue to work with those, but shouldn't yield those um, in order to achieve the solution. The other thing that I wanted to say is that I think that smart cities approaches are incredibly relevant for local governments, regardless of their size. And we're in a new, we're in a really new space here, so one of, a real question for me is what, what, what really do smart cities approaches and technologies look like for small and rural communities, that we're at a very new place with that. We don't, there's not a lot of examples out there yet, but they're emerging and we're starting to see them. And when I look at our project, you know, these are all the things that are already in the municipal wheelhouse. These are already matters that are totally relevant for municipal governments everywhere. And, and they are all connected through the technologies and the information systems that we're pulling together for our initiative. So it's really using existing jurisdiction and existing tools and systems, but enhancing them. And then lastly, uh, just a couple thoughts again on, on, on the role for municipalities. Let's reclaim the wording, you know, smart cities as really just good problem solving. Um, I'm a scientist by training. And I like to think of smart cities approaches as using scientific approaches to, you know, but, but you know, human design sort of influenced science um, in, in, in municipal government. The tools are here, so why don't, why, don't we just, why don't we use them? They are here, they're wonderful, they're interesting, they deliver. We also think that it's a new opportunity for integrative thinking because we're, we're beginning to question. We can use it as a way to question assumptions and to question relationships and power structures and so on. 
And then the, important, the importance of ongoing evaluation, which is what the data tells you. If you use data well, it'll tell you whether you're making progress or not. And then finally, if we don't take charge of this conversation, if we don't take charge of this space and lay the ground rules for engagement, chances are the private sector will. And I think that that's an outcome that I'm not really sure that I want my community to experience. I'd rather be in control of that conversation space. So in conclusion, the thing that I wanted to leave you with today um, as an inspiration is that I think that smart cities are an opportunity for public institutions, regardless of what part of government they work for, not just to build a better mousetrap or to get with the time or whatever, but it's actually an opportunity for creating transformational change um, for sustainability, for equity, for prosperity. Let's make use of these tools, but let's do it with eyes wide open. Thank you.